uh, yes hello uh, happy welcome to this one year uh, i call it phd intensive we study very hard one hour per day we study um, how to live well how to prosper how to prosper in our life family community country and the world how to build peace and we really want to have this life life change experience for everyone so there's i invite uh, uh, one of my good friend uh, william heinz he is uh, um, one of the greatest men i know he was teaching uh, a divine principle that we will study 40 days uh, till now he was teaching everywhere in many countries and i meet him in cambodia uh, he was teaching this how to apply this uh, divine principle on uh, uh, real substantial uh, communities to build model peace communities that uh, this is our laboratory that in one year we try to build this uh, model peace community in our uh, uh, families <laughs> in our communities and uh, everywhere where we can uh, anyhow um, uh, this is our VIP guest today uh, he have great experience uh, he he want to uh, propose it as a, ans a question and answer session something like this to talk with each other uh, so um, uh, what I I want to ask him first question and then he go around with others uh, first question is um, uh, William you have great experience about teaching divine principle even the communist uh, Soviet Union <laughs> so um, uh, we need something substantial how to apply it you already was in the the globe uh, and you analyze how to how it it work uh, how it did work beautiful because uh, you know from the from the religious perspective uh, jesus said that suppo uh, we're supposed to forget what to eat and where to sleep <laughs> and to think about kingdom and it uh, seems like kingdom is supposed to be built now <laughs> by 2027 2025 so uh, uh, let me think let me say so brainstorm how we could make from the the the, the, the communities that are uh, how to say uh, dividing right now you know uh, for the carrying each other communities uh, of course like theoretically you know with God's love <laughs> but uh, uh, anyhow we, I, I was just uh, you know um, I'm speaking a lot to the uh, brother and sisters from across the globe as you see uh, and uh, like uh, of course from Africa and Asia they are crying there is difficulties no money no other things uh, uh, but also I heard uh, from the uh, USA the, the sisters was crying that uh, uh, in the so-called developed world they so developed people became so crazy uh, how to say uh, um, uh, busy and serious uh, that uh, they couldn't joke with them if you joke they could kill you they couldn't understand you right so <laughs> so where go <laughs> world is going <laughs> uh, anyhow, uh, yeah yeah so it seems you are older than us you you have a lot of knowledge and the experience so uh, please share just anything what you can one one hour and more so happy welcome <laughs> let's invite him push the, <laughs> the heart <laughs> Yeah, happy welcome. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, sorry, all others who don't speak, please turn off microphone. We want to hear just William. Uh, Kenya and all others who, who don't turn off microphone, please turn off microphone. Me too. Okay. All right. Good. I'm not quite sure what time of the day it is everywhere. I think uh, here it's um, six o'clock and well, 20 past six in the evening. I guess many of the, you who are living in Africa is probably a similar sort of time. But obviously in, in the United States, America, it's a very different kind of time. Anyway, so Nikolai, I think I met Nikolai first ooh, a long time ago, maybe 30 years ago, when I was uh, living and working in Russia for seven years. And um, so I've been invited there. And I was working to develop uh, an educational program for spiritual a moral development of young people living in a, in the former Soviet Union, basically in in countries which had been communist and very very secular. And so, by background, I have that kind of experience of religious education teacher, and so I worked there for seven years, developing a series of programs to be used in um, the former Soviet Union, and they were adopted by several different ministries of education in Russia, Tajikistan, Azerbaijan, uh, Kazakhstan, and uh, various other places as well, Mongolia. And so for me, I think education is, is very, very important. Anyway, um, Nikolai was asking about uh, building an ideal society. I don't know if it's possible to build an ideal society, 
But uh, basically, at the end of the day, really what everybody wants to live in is a peaceful society and a just society. And the uh, problem with an ideal society is it means you know, it's, it's very problematic trying to create an ideal society. But it is much more practical to try and create a, a just society and a peaceful society. And um, as you know, the world in which we're living, there's a lot of places where there is no peace. There are lots of wars. So it's very difficult to talk about an ideal when the most basic thing has to be solved, which is war. And um, I can see most of you, I think, are from Africa. Uh, you'd be surprised to know I'm from Africa as well. I was born in Uganda. That's where my parents met, and that's where they married. And I was born in Kampala. And then uh, my sister was born a couple of years later in Mombasa. And then I also spent some time, because my parents worked in Nigeria for three years. So I, I visited them there, and also my they worked in Lesotho. So I went to, uh, there and went to... Um, is there in various places. And then the last 25 years of her life, my mother lived in a, just outside Durban in South Africa. So I used to go there very, very often to visit her there. And uh, as you know, it's a stunningly beautiful continent, but uh, it's, uh, you yeah, know, there are many problems uh, of all kinds of problems. But at um, the end of the day, whenever whatever country you look at, you can see there are problems. And so I come, f although I was born in Uganda, basically I'm, I'm British um, and my wife is Swiss. Uh, and you might think, well, Britain and Switzerland, they're incredibly wealthy and prosperous and uh, societies. And usually when people come to Britain, they often wonder, how is it possible that this country ruled a quarter of the, a quarter of the world? Uh, it's a bit shocking if you come here because it's a bit of a mess nowadays. But uh, yeah, the only reason why Britain was able to attain that kind of status was because it was able to find some internal peace. And it's very interesting to try and figure out, well, how did that come about? So Britain, as you probably know, is made up of four different nations, as Wales and, and uh, Northern Ireland as well. And uh, it's, that's why it's called the United Kingdom because it's a country in which there are four different uh, ethnic groups, four different nationalities, um, and uh, several different languages. So how is it possible to bring peace? Uh, it's not perfect, uh, but somehow we're able to live together. But if you go back to, to look at just England, I mean, Scotland is a very different kind of society, very different kind of uh, makeup. It's a clan society. Uh, Historically, it's a clan society with different clans that fight each other, that have wars with each other, stealing sheep and everything. England was, again, a different kind of society, a uh, different country. Uh, people living in Scotland, Wales and Ireland are basically historically Celtic, with their own Celtic language, Gaelic, their own genealogy. It's a very different kind of uh, ethnic group. The English are often called Anglo-Saxons because in the 5th century, then um, different tribes from different German tribes, Germanic tribes, came and they settled in England. And when they settled in England, they basically invaded England, they settled. And for a long time, there were, it's called the Heptarchy, there were seven different kingdoms within England. And the tribes used to fight each other as well. And so the question is, well, how to bring about peace within England? How to create a united English society? And uh, so early on, the uh, <clears throat> uh, yeah, the English they became Christian, and then the Christian Church said that okay, according to the uh, Christian marriage laws, people are not allowed to marry their first cousin, their second cousin, their third cousin, or their fourth cousin. So it meant people had to go outside their own kinship group in order to get married. Going outside their own kinship group meant they had to get married to people of different tribes or in different kingdoms. And so over a period of many, many hundreds of years, because it said you have you cannot get married to somebody from within your own clan or from within your own tribe. You have to get married to somebody from outside. 
And so people ended up getting married to people from different kinship groups. And so over a period of time, then the people no longer felt were well, Jutes, Saxon, um, Angles, or were all these different tribes that came over from um, Germany. They all started to think of themselves as being English, one nationality. And then interestingly enough, uh, a few hundred years later, then uh, England was invaded by the Vikings. And they, again, from a different language, they were from uh, Scandinavia, and they invaded England, and they conquered and settled in half of England. And for a long time, there were wars. They were fighting between the English and the Vikings, the Northmen. And the question was then, okay, how are we going to establish peace in our little island? We can't. And so a lot of the English, they wanted to drive the, the Vikings out to expel them from the country. But by that time, there were too many living in England. And so there was a very, very wise king in the ninth century. His name was Alfred the Great. And he was uh, became the king because his, bro his brothers had been killed fighting the Vikings. And eventually he became the king. He inherited the crown. And he's trying to figure out, well, what are we going to do? How are we going to deal with this reality of our country, half our country being occupied by these foreigners who, who have a different nationality to us, different religion to us because they were pagans. The English at that stage were already Christians. They had a different language, very, very different. Anyway, so one day, it was during the winter, and uh, the Viking army was um, camped uh, for the winter. And so King Alfred, he dressed up in ordinary clothes and he took his lute or harp and he went into the Viking camp to play the music. And he got to know the, 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 uh, the prince of the Vikings very, very well and won his respect through the music he was playing and the, the, the friendship which they developed. At the same time, Alfred, he realized that the Vikings didn't have any enough supplies to keep them going through the winter. And so he realized the Vikings are actually very weak at this moment. And so he raised an army, an English army, a Saxon army, and they laid siege to the Vikings. And eventually the Vikings ate up all their food and they wanted to surrender. Now Alfred's um, men, the warriors with him, they wanted to kill all the Vikings, put them to death. But Alfred said, no, that's not going to solve the problem. We may kill them all, but then more will come back. So he said, look, this is what we're going to do. And he went and he spoke to the prince of the Vikings, and he revealed himself who he really was. He was the king. And he said to them, look, if you are willing to be baptized and to become Christians, then we will allow you to live in our country. And so that's what happened. Then uh, Alfred the Great, he became the godfather of the, of the prince of the Vikings. And all the Viking warriors were all baptized. And over time, they became Christians. And over time, then all the Vikings became Christians. And if you look at England today, you, don't, you can't realize, well, actually, there were two different peoples settled in this country of England. There were the Sax Anglo-Saxons, and there were the Vikings, because they all became English. So even though many of the towns on the east coast of, of England, they still have Viking names, and in the east coast of England, still a few Viking words around. Basically, nobody thinks of themselves, oh, we're Vikings and, and you're Saxons. Everybody thinks of themselves as being English. So that was really important in terms of intermarriage, to bring about peace and unity within a country. And, uh, <clears throat> and of course, that is a challenge. You know, because you can't, if you just try and fight, uh, you, basically the fighting goes on forever. Uh, and that's that's what happened in England, how to bring peace in England. But then England itself was invaded another, another time, 600 years later, by William the Conqueror. He was French, and he conquered England, and he stole all the land away from the English. And he gave it all to his French, his French followers who were warriors. And for 200 years, all the ruling class in England, they didn't speak English. They all spoke French. And so the English had to digest and think, okay, how are we going to deal with the fact that we've been occupied, 
we've been conquered and we've been ruled by these foreigners for 200 years. Difficult. But anyway, over time, for various reasons, uh, uh, the king lost his land in France, and the, the king and the ruling class started to learn English, and eventually they became English as well. But the land that they stole, they still have. It's not possible to change these kind of things. You have to accept, okay, we fought, we lost. Okay, now where do we go on from here? Uh, so that was the way the English have always dealt with this kind of problem. Uh, unfortunately, in Ireland, they didn't deal with it the same kind of way. And so still, there's a huge amount of conflict between Catholics and Protestants uh, and between uh, a lot of resentment towards the, the English in particular. Still problems in Scotland. And so under the Normans, the French-speaking rulers of England, England tried to conquer Scotland many, many times, but every time it was defeated. And then the question is, well, okay, how are we going to unite England and Scotland? So when Queen Elizabeth died in the 16th, end of the 16th century, the question is, well, who is going, because she didn't, she never married, she didn't have any children, the question was, well, okay, who's going to sit on the throne of England? Who's going to be the next monarch, king or queen? And so after she died, the elders, the wise people got together and they thought, well, the best thing to do is invite the king of Scotland to become the king of England and Scotland. So this is the way in which Britain was united, not by England conquering Scotland, but by England inviting the ruler of Scotland to become the ruler of England and Scotland together. And um, so, that, yeah, there are lots of interesting lessons here, how you try to, to bring about unity, how you to bring about to society. At the same time that England and Scotland became a sing part of a single country, it first started with um, um, one king over both countries, but well, they still had two separate parliaments. And then eventually, for various reasons, they decided to have one parliament in, in London. But at the same time, they became one country. Scotland continued to have its own church, the Church of Scotland. England continued to have its own church, the Church of England. Scottish law still is Scottish law. English law is English law. And until very recently, if you were a Scottish lawyer, you couldn't work in England. If you're an English lawyer, you couldn't work in Scotland. That's the way it was, because the Scots wanted to keep their own law, their own educational system, which is still different to the English one, their own uh, university system, which is still different to the English one, their own religion, their own law. Uh, and so this is the way in which they're able to live together, uh, because at one point, England tried to dominate Scotland, but that wasn't going to work. You have to, uh, so the English then had to say, okay, we'll allow the Scots to continue to have their own language, their own culture, their own way of life, their own institutions, but we will cooperate where we can cooperate. And that's very, very important um, to have that decentralization. As I said, my wife, she's a Swiss from Switzerland. And uh, Switzerland also is a very interesting country because it's made up of four different languages and two different religions. And so, as you may know, for hundreds of years, Catholics and Protestants in Europe fought each other and killed each other. Hundreds, some of the worst, the worst wars in European history, were the wars in the 17th century between the Protestants and the Catholics, where each tried to dominate the other. It wasn't stopped until the middle of the 17th century when they realized none of us, neither side can win. Let's just accept you're Protestants and we're Catholics and let's just try and live at peace with each other in trying to impose our religion upon each other. It took, took 140 years of fighting to come to that realization and that, that understanding. So anyway, in, in, in Switzerland then, as I said, they have, they have uh, four different language groups. Uh, they have a large French-speaking uh, community there, a large German-speaking community there, a large Italian-speaking community there, and a smaller a community which speaks a language called Romanish, which is a very old Latin kind of language. And the question is, okay, how are you going to have a country at peace with itself 
where you have two different religions, Catholicism and Protestantism, and four different language groups. And of course, it's very tempting for the largest, one of the largest language groups to want to dominate the whole country. But if you, if you try and do that, of course, it leads to civil wars. And for, for a long time, there were different wars within Switzerland until eventually the people realized, well, the only way we can manage to live at peace with each other is to have a very, very decentralized system. And so Switzerland is made up of lots of cantons. Nobody's ever heard of the president of Switzerland because the president of Switzerland has no power. Nobody's really heard very much about the government of Switzerland or, or the prime minister because they don't have power. So the way the Swiss worked it out, they said, okay, we have to decentralize everything to the, this little group called a canton. So within a canton, they would all be speaking, they'd all be the same, uh, uh, they'd all either be Protestants or all be Catholics, they'd all be either German speaking or French speaking or Italian speaking or Romanish speaking. And I forget how many cantons, about 15 different cantons. So everything is 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 uh, decentralized. And so each canton then, it runs its own school system. Each canton then decides everything that is appropriate for their own particular canton. What works best in their town? What works best in their city? What works best for them? So there's not a unified, so even though they're all Swiss, there isn't a single system. And then in order to change the law, it's very interesting. The reason why nobody's heard of the pres of, of any Swiss politicians is Swiss, Swiss politicians don't have much power. Usually when people go into politics, they're looking for power. Why do they want power? Usually it's because they want to change things to the way they think they ought to be. That's one reason. So often idealists go into politics because they want to change the society to conform to a particular ideal that they have. Okay. And of course, never, not, not everybody agrees or wants that ideal. And so you have clashes between people with different ideals. And that's why you have so much conflict. Another reason why people often go into politics, they're not just for power, but it's for money. Because they think, well, with this power comes the ability to become very rich. Because then I can control the money, the taxes. And so these are two of the, the reasons why people often go into politics, for power, so that either they can dominate others and also for money. So the Swiss realized this and they said, okay, in order to, for power means people want the politicians want the power to change the law, to make the law and to use the law to change society, to make it the way they think it ought to be, which often includes uh, getting money for themselves. So the Swiss decided, okay, politicians, we're not going to allow politicians to make the laws. So there's a Swiss constitution, that's not the laws. And in the Swiss constitution, it says that anybody, <laughs> any new laws have to be voted upon by a referendum. So it means if any politician wants to change the law, they have to come up with, <coughs> <coughs> which can only be done on a canton level, a local level. They have to go around persuading everybody that this new law is better than the way things were before. And they have to persuade people, and then there's a vote. And so all the people within the canton vote upon whether to change the law or not. And generally speaking, people like things the way they are. People don't want to change things unless they see there's a problem. So that's why a Swiss society is very, very conservative, because it works. People are prosperous, they're living at peace with each other, things are working well. And if the politician wants to change, if somebody wants to change something, they have to persuade everybody this is a good way, good thing to change. And then they have a vote on it and there's a referendum. It's very interesting. So that's why you don't hear Swiss politicians, because there's no power. You become a president of Switzerland, you have no power. You don't have the control over the money. That's not under the control of the president or the politicians either. And so that, I would say, is one of the reasons why Switzerland is the most prosperous and peaceful country in the entire world, despite the fact it's made up of many different religions, several different religions, and quite a few different language groups. So 
that, that again, it's like a sort of a model, you might say, of how to bring about a peaceful and good society. It comes about by not trying to dominate other people and trying to force them to conform to the way you think they ought to be. When you get that happening, then you get wars. You look at what's going on in Russia and Ukraine. You know, that is because one, one country wants to dominate another country. At the same time, the problems are not just between Russia and Ukraine. The problems were problems within Ukraine itself. You know, because half the people living in Ukraine were Russian speakers. Half the people living in Ukraine were Ukrainian speakers. And a problem came about when people, Ukrainians predominantly wanted everybody to speak one language. Everyone should speak Ukrainian. But of course, the Russian-speaking people in Ukraine didn't want their children to learn Ukrainian. They wanted them to carry on speaking Russian. And so that was why one of the problems happened in the eastern region called Donbass. Because of that, <clears throat> sorry, I just got to plug my laptop in. Or am I going to run out of power? <clears throat> and then, so that was part of the problem there within Ukraine, but there was a part of the problem Russia didn't acknowledge that Ukrainians were Ukrainians and thought they were just friends. And so, you know, that's a problem as well. So one needs to recognize people have their own nationality, their own identity, which they want to maintain and they want to keep, their own language, they want to carry on speaking, their own religion that they want to carry on practicing. And one has to acknowledge and respect that and find ways to live in peace. Okay, you have a different religion to me. I'm not going to try and force you to adopt my religion. You have a different language to me. Okay, let's live at peace with each other. You, within your own town or city or part of the country, you speak this language, and we speak this language, but we can still be friends. So the way to cross these kind of barriers is not by trying to unite the world and make everyone speak the same language, or to have the same laws, or to have this, everyone have the same identity. It's through friendship, through people being able to respect each other's uh, identity and be friends with each other. And so we talk about, Nikolai mentioned, you know, you, you bring about a, a good world through love. Well, the best kind of love in this case is friendship. Is to make friends with people of different nationalities, or within one's or within one's own country, different towns, different places, and through this kind of friendship, it means that you friendship, of course, is based upon mutual respect. You're not trying to make your friend something like you. You're not trying to make your friend adopt your religion, or make your friend conform to what you're like. Actually, a lot of friendships come about through difference. Yeah, because we we recognise that we're different other and that's why it's interesting to have a conversation with someone who's different to yourself it's very interesting having conversations with people who have a different outlook on life wow i never i was never able to see the world in that way until i had this conversation with you and i can see things through your eyes which is a very different perspective to mine but when everybody sees things from the same point of view to be honest it's kind of boring and there's no creativity there new no new ideas but creativity often comes about when you get people with different ideas, different perspectives, talking to each other, sharing with each other, learning from each other, and creating a new, something new, which, of course, things which uh, creativity leads to new things. And new things often come about through the interaction or give and take, if you like, between two different perspectives comes up with a, a new idea, a new way of looking at things. And so that's why it's very important then for there to be difference and diversity. You may know England, you know, I talked a little bit about English history, but there are other things that happened here as well. This is the birthplace of the agricultural revolution. It's the birthplace of the industrial revolution. Uh, and you might wonder, well, why did the industrial revolution take place in England? And, and Scotland as well, before any other country in the world. Is, is it because the English are more intelligent? No, not at all. It's really important to understand why. So the first thing is because eventually there were wars within England between the Catholics and Protestants and different religious groups, but eventually decided 
okay, no, we, nobody's going to win. We have to have religious freedom. With religious freedom comes the means you can talk about all kinds of ideas. When you have a uniformity of religion, then if you come up with a new idea, then you regard it as being a heretic. And in the past, you could have been put to death. And so people are often afraid to say what they thought because if they if they if they cause offence, they might be put to death, burnt at the stake. That's what happened between Catholics and Protestants in England in the seventeenth century, in the sixteenth century, seventeenth century. But eventually, they said, "Okay, we're going to have freedom of religion. Anybody can uh, think what they want to think about God." And then people were no longer afraid to express what they thought. People are no longer afraid to become atheists because they weren't didn't, weren't afraid of being persecuted. But along with this freedom of religion came a freedom of being able to think, a freedom of speech, a freedom to be able to come up with new ideas without being afraid. And we're coming up with these new ideas, and then people could have new new philosophies, new ideas, and then they could have new inventions about different ways of doing things. <clears throat> so that was really important. This freedom of religion is so important, freedom of speech. And then that's connected to what you will have studied and called the first blessing. Yeah, freedom of to be, to unity in mind and body, freedom to worship God in the way you want to worship God, which of course means freedom of ideas and freedom of speech. The second aspect, I talked about how uh, through marriage, England became united. But then along with that came about uh, <clears throat> something called the, the common law, which many of your countries will have inherited the tradition of common law. <clears throat> so it became a common law society, which is which is governed by the rule of law. And the important point was that the king in England never had the authority to make new laws. Laws were created by the way of life of the people. There were traditions. As a way of life, this was expressed in traditions and habits and, and customs and ways of doing things. And these customs and ways of doing things then were protected by laws. And so the law there was not created by the king to dominate people. The law was there to protect the way of life of the people, including freedom of speech and freedom of religion. And so then you had a society in which there's a rule of law and justice. That meant people, even, even the king, wasn't allowed to go and steal people's property. The, every, the, everyone had to be under the law. And so when you had the rule of law, that meant that people um, realized there was justice. Anybody who, who went around stealing was arrested and put in prison. And so that meant people felt free to go and buy and sell things because there was no organized crime rackets. The police to put organized criminals in prison. And then thirdly, that's connected to the second blessing, the idea of uh, law and uh, justice. And thirdly, there was... Uh, private property. So everybody owned their own house, their own piece of land, and people could buy it and sell it, and they could do anything they wanted. So somebody thought, okay, I've come up with a brilliant idea. Instead of farming the way I used to farm, I want to farm differently with a different kind of machine. And they were allowed to do that. They didn't have to ask anybody's permission. They had the freedom to experiment and develop new ways of farming, which is why the agricultural revolution took place. And if they came up with a new machine, they could build a factory on their land and put in a new machinery. They didn't have to ask anybody's permission to do that. They didn't have to pay bribes to anybody to do that. It was their land. They could build a factory and they could make whatever they wanted and they could take it to the market and sell it, knowing that they would be protected by the law. And so because of this then, basically the three blessings are established in Britain. That's why Britain became such a prosperous country. And eventually, through trade, came to, um, you know, to, came to rule a quarter of the world's population. Um, you know, and it was huge. The British Empire, of course, it doesn't exist anymore. Uh, there's a mixture of good things and bad things. And um, still there's a legacy. There's uh, the British Commonwealth. And so these, these things are very, very important you know, to think about practically how to create a better society. And the best way to do this is to learn from other societies how they've, the challenges they faced, the way they became these challenges. You can see, you look at the history of different countries, 
you can see some countries, when they face a challenge, they went in one direction. And it became a dictatorship or became totalitarian or very, very oppressive. Another country faced a similar kind of challenge and it went and chose to a different path and went in a different direction and was able to overcome that challenge and become a more peaceful uh, and prosperous kind of society in which there's peace and justice. So, you know, you all come from different countries and you all have different experiences, uh, particularly, you know, if you're from Africa, different colonial experiences, whether it's the French, the British, the Portuguese, the Belgian, German kind of empires that uh, intervened at some point in the history. And, yeah, left it obviously a legacy, a legacy of a mixture of good things and bad things. And the thing is, okay, what can we learn from this? How can we digest this? How can we take this forward? How can we try to solve some of the problems of the legacy of colonialism? It's obviously impossible to turn the clock back. England itself was colonized. Britain itself was colonized by the Anglo-Saxons and by the Normans. And also, you know, and also had to think, okay, how are we going to deal with these foreigners who invaded our country and how we're going to, and left a certain kind of legacy? How are we going to deal with this legacy in a way that's going to mean our society can, can become uh, more peaceful and more fair and more just? And um, which I think is what we all want that kind of peace. Okay, I anyway, I've talked for long enough. Uh, Nikolai said uh, up an hour, so I spoke it's five to seven now, I think. And so, anybody have any questions or anything they'd like to ask me? Please, um, if you do, please unmute yourself. Yeah. Yeah, please speak. Bernadette, you yeah. need to unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you very much for your presentation from Cameroon. That's Usman. Thanks, Usman. Yeah, yeah, please, I just want you to guide us on how to go about considering our own case in Cameroon here. How can we approach that? How, what are some of the methods we can use in order to bring peace? Thank yeah, you. Well, all, all I can say is one has to look at different historical examples where people were successful and think, okay, it worked in Britain or worked in Switzerland or worked here. How can we adapt that for our, our own situation? <coughs> I think it's always better not to learn from abstract principles. Um, it's always much better to learn from experience. And if one hasn't got experience oneself, one can learn from other people's experience. And then one can think, okay, that's what worked for them. You know, is there anything we can learn from what happened in their country or how we can solve things within our own country? And I would say, mm -hmm. that's all I can say, experience is so important. So many people change the world based back principles, um, but it has to be grounded in experience. Either it works or it doesn't work. Yeah. So that's why I didn't give a lecture based on abstract principles, but just try to you know, share some practical experiences about how to create a more peaceful and just and fair. And, you know, you might say ideal society, but I don't think there's such an ideal society. Lots of ways of creating a peaceful and just society. There's no single way which is going to work for everybody. That's the problem. People often think that. Actually, every country, every community has to find the way that works for them. And that's really important. And uh, as I said, we'll learn from experiences of others, uh, which is why I, I read a lot about history. I read a lot of British history. I read a lot of Swiss history. <clears throat> I read a lot of Russian history. Because I wanted to learn from the ex historical experience of other people. And from that, you can also learn, well, what mistakes you should avoid. That's really important. You can either learn from your own, you can either learn from other people's mistakes, or you can learn from your own mistakes. But it's better to learn from other people's mistakes than to have to learn from your own mistakes. Uh, anyhow, I want to ask you, anyhow, for, from what you present, if you allow me, <laughs> um, you know, there is a great trend in so-called um, 
mining, all of this decentralization, you know, Web3 and everything. So it seems like like uh, the world of this digital is going there uh, anyhow. Then some country they try to came back to totalitarianism, but anyhow, the the main trend is to what you said about the Swiss, you know, like to to make this kind of decentralized community and that everybody could prosper, something like this. So. Uh, uh, and also you said that Swiss is, is developing, like, is stable because they are, how to say, they, they have this decentralized and going. So, and, and also what we are, what we are studying from all of this recent development is that uh, uh, to build this kind of model peace communities, that have communities could become independent and if they care for each other. So I, I was thinking if we have their... Uh, 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 Muisa Kulu from uh, from um, DRC. So so uh, for now, like everybody is just for themselves, you know. And uh, when they came, like for example, these uh, um, uh, uh, these fighters, they come to communities so everybody run. But if community was united together, maybe they could not fight, but at least somehow protect their community. So that I I try to say. <laughs> what about this decentralization? Maybe you could uh, say a little bit more. All right. Okay, the most important function of government is to defend the country from being invaded. That's the most important function of government, is to defend the country from being invaded. So the reality of the world in which we're living in, if we can see there are some people who are not very nice. They want to take over one's country or take over one's community or take over one's house or whatever and steal it, basically. So it's really important then to have a, a strong government to defend a country, which obviously requires a military. That's the first function of government. The second function of government is to uphold justice and uphold the law to make sure criminals go to prison. <clears throat> and one of the most important laws is the law of property, that people shouldn't be allowed and able to steal land that belongs to other people. So the land then shouldn't belong to the state. That doesn't work. The whole history of communism is when the state owns the land and owns the business, everything. It's a disaster. Land should be owned. Everything should be owned privately by private property. People should be able to buy and sell the land that they have. <clears throat> and that means <clears throat> that, you know, in Africa, for example, you have to have a government that's going to make sure it protects the land and the environment and doesn't allow foreign com companies to come in for mining and, ex and cause of exploitation. It's, and the problem is that a lot of these foreign companies, big mining companies, they have a lot of money. And so they bribe the government. <clears throat> and that leads to a phenomenal amount of corruption. The reason why they can do this is because the government owns the land. Uh, and so they're able to do that. If the land was you know, owned by the ordinary people, then they could decide these things for themselves. One could also have laws preventing foreign companies coming in and buying the land. <clears throat> uh, and so you allow the, you know, encourage indigenous companies to, to, to develop these, this, this kind of thing themselves. So Britain, for example, I said the Industrial Revolution started here. All the train systems, steam engines, all this machinery and technology was developed here. <clears throat> but then it was exported and people in other countries bought it and they develop their own factories and their own mechanisms. Um, and I think that's very important to, you know, to, to be able to defend one's country and to uphold the law. <clears throat> and one of the most important factors I forgot to mention, well, I did mention it in England, was the spread of Christianity. Because with the spread of Christianity came the sense of conscience. <clears throat> with a sense of conscience came this idea, oh, I shouldn't exploit somebody else. I shouldn't mistreat people. I should treat people fairly. And what it says in the Bible, most important thing all the prophets say is to treat people justly and fairly. And so with the spread of Christianity, this changed English society hugely, unbelievably, and it became much, much less corrupt. It was very corrupt before, but with the spread of Christianity, Britain became a much less corrupt society. And when you have less corruption, you don't have the politicians stealing all the money. So the spread of Christianity and the spread of religion then is incredibly important. And, but it also has to be freedom of religion at the same time. Not a single religion, but the spread of Christianity made a huge impact, developed a sense of conscience.
And then people thought, oh, I should observe, I should follow the law. I shouldn't break the law. <clears throat> I shouldn't go around stealing things that belong to other people. I shouldn't go around killing people because they're getting in my way. But without Christianity, then people don't have much of a conscience and they're willing just to give in <clears throat> and follow power and greed and uh, desire for money and for everything else. So I really say that is one of the fun, as I said, in Britain, they became a Christian country and then you had freedom of religion and then the rule of law and then private property and free trade. These are the, th these are the three blessings. Freedom of religion and a Christian and, and people being Christian, following their conscience, <clears throat> stable families, and the rule of law and justice, and then private property and free trade, which is just a, an expression of give and take. That's what the economy is about: buying and selling, without uh, a corrupt, uh, organized criminal network wanting to um, have protection money or steal your money. Okay, I'm afraid I have to go now. I'm really sorry because I'm really enjoying this. But if Nikolai wants to, I said to Nikolai, it's free between six and seven, but it's just gone seven. I've got another appointment. May I ask you one, one last uh, question? Maybe you could say short answer. <laughs> Anyhow, for now, unfortunately, you know, uh, the, uh, there was a research about the United Nations and uh, they were thinking of the f f uh, second world war that they will build like a world, world equal to everyone uh, but actually it became uh, so almost nothing changed as i i study like tolstoy you know he was studying all, everything how to make peace and uh, anything remained the same you know like uh, what was like 150 years ago the same is remain now so the question is um, you know the world a little bit uh, how to say uh, crystallized it became one percent of the rich people like uh, pop uh, top stars on all this you know like people with power and money in every country <laughs> and another 95 99 percent is just simple people as us so so uh, almost in every country is the same so uh, also uh, comparing with this like uh, like i i heard from the arabian uh, they somehow the national resources they divided between themselves their clans so uh, what is better <laughs> how to fix this issue because uh, the revolution will will never stop till till the this one percent of population will not unite help another 99. well i don't think your figures are correct <clears throat> it varies a lot from country to country <clears throat> in some countries the state only thing not the people the state in some countries and then it a lot of the money then flows to politicians. Certainly there are some incredibly wealthy people, uh, you know, people who invented Facebook or Google or these kind of people. But these aren't people who've stolen money from other people. They're people who came up with a new idea. And this idea became very popular. So, of course, they profited from it. So lots of people who become very wealthy through business and through starting companies, they have an idea to improve something. They make something that people want to buy. As a result of that, they get a reward for buying it. <clears throat> the reward is called profit. And so all these companies, you know, because they happen to be very successful, because they're fulfilling people's desires and needs for whatever it is, whether it's a computers, a Apple, or whatever it is, or a particular cars. And so all these companies have become profitable. And of course, people who own the companies, the shareholders, they become, you know, they earn money. I don't see a problem whatsoever with that. The problem comes about, you know, um, yeah, but, but I don't see that as a problem. The problem comes about usually when people use the power of the state to enrich themselves. So the state is not creative. The state does not generate or create wealth. The state then, when it's controlled by politicians, we want to use the power of the state to take money away from the people who made the money and to take the wealth which they didn't create themselves and take it for themselves. And so often this is through incredibly high rates of taxation, for example, and then you get people who become bureaucrats and they start, again, they're not wealth generating, they don't create anything, they're not a creative force within society. They're, they're living off the, the, the wealth that's created by other people. 
And so in order to create a better society, you need to create freedom where people have the freedom to be creative and to create wealth and to be able to know that this wealth isn't going to be stolen by somebody else, whether it's somebody with an army invading their country or somebody with a gun stealing their car or somebody who is a fraudster stealing the money from their bank, you know, or whatever it is. That's the problem. Uh, you know, and again, if you look at it historically, how did people become very wealthy? <coughs> in Britain, the people became incredibly wealthy in the past. They were the people who uh, were French. When William the Conqueror conquered the country, he divided all the land up and gave it to all his soldiers and stole it all from the English. Well, okay, how do you deal with that? So the English then, they didn't, they were not landowners. <coughs> Instead, they came up with inventions. The industrial was created by the landowners or the aristocracy. It was created by ordinary Christians who were usually Quakers or Protestants who had no money, but they had ideas. And they're very, very creative. And through the, their creativity, they created wealth. And so that became the new rich people, well, not the old rich people who stole the land. It's the new rich people who created businesses. And uh, you know, to try to get them all the land back from the old rich people who conquered the country a thousand years ago, I mean, it just would lead to a civil war. It's not helpful to think like that. So the best way is to create opportunities for people to become wealthier. And wealth gen is created by people being religious, living a moral, conscientious life, having a stable family, and having private property. <clears throat> and these are the three things which are essential to wealth creation. <clears throat> Somebody called George Gilder wrote a book about this a long time ago. Religion, family, and private property. <clears throat> these, are the, these are the fundamental things. And when there's private property which is protected by the law, then people can't come and steal it. Yeah. Okay, I must go. If you want to invite me back another time, Nikolai, uh, I'd be more than happy to come back because you're such wonderful people. I can't see many of your faces, but the faces that I can see are I can see your your wonderful people, and I really respect and admire the work that you're doing and the the desire that you have to put the principle into practice. That's my only my interest is how does the principle apply practically, you know, within an individual's life, within a family's life, but also within a society and a nation's life, and also how do you apply the principle to politics to to economics as well. So that's the sort of things I was trying to share, share how the principles applied in the life of this my country Britain, but also in Switzerland, and that's why they became prosperous countries. The reason for Britain's decline today is because it's no longer based upon those kind of principles. And so it's declining, becoming more and more corrupt and more. Anyway, I really must go. So, so Yeah, thank um, you very much, William. Uh, how about if you like our company, how about meeting one per week? Uh, I can't meet next week, but you, you, you arrange, you, you, you asked me another date. Anyway, at least two weeks or three weeks' time. Next week, I'm, I have other engagements. No Actually, problem. the next two, I got other next two weeks. I have other engagements, but if, in, a, in a couple of weeks' time, yeah, I'll be really happy to to see you all and to share with you. And also, I'm really interested in listening to where you're coming from and your own kind of challenges you have within your own countries and communities. Anyway, so I must go. I'll leave, I'll leave the Zoom open so you can carry on talking, Nikolai. Uh, so, I think we could finish now, but uh, uh, <laughs> homework from the William. Please prepare, as always, uh, he emphasized, you know, the most idea, creativity. So uh, please prepare you questions, like Bernadette in USA, and you also from Cameroon, and uh, other, like Usman, others. Please prepare you questions, concrete questions, to William, okay, next time, in two weeks. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. God bless yeah. you all. Yeah. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.
Bye bye. Yeah, turn on Thank your you. cameras and microphone. Say bye bye in your language. Bye bye. 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 Bye <laughs> jamba jamba. <laughs> okay, I like it. Lakini mimi sikusikia mzuri. Mzuri okay. <laughs> good, good. Thank you one one more time William. You are great. Keep going there. We pray for you. <laughs> God bless you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Yeah, thank you. Okay, all the best brothers and sisters. So good. Uh, yeah, don't forget homework. Ask thousands of questions. If you ask questions Creativity is going. <laughs> yeah, bye bye. I supposed to go to bye bye Bernadette. You should turn on microphone. Maybe you want to say something, Bernadette, because we want to hear you. Maybe you could turn on microphone. Yeah, you microphone. Uh, the, 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 there is a, there is a Zoom microphone well, always working. Just turn on microphone. Uh, the Zoom is better. Don't work again. Bye. Ah, uh, okay. Don't work anyhow. Yeah, bye bye. So, thank you very much. Bye oh. bye, Bernadette. Bye bye, Musa. <laughs> yeah, meet tomorrow, yeah. same time, same place. With more, I will try to invite yeah, in one tomorrow. year program more VIPs like Williams, and we could uh, discuss together, develop together. Okay. Uh, chat is open on Facebook and Facebook and uh, WhatsApp. Just write there thousands of questions, thousands of ideas, proposals, and let's do it. Let's move the world. Let's build peace there. <laughs> bye bye, Usman. <laughs> Bye bye William. Bye -bye. <laughs> All bye -bye. the best. Bye bye Bernadette. Bye bye Lydia. Bye bye everyone. Bye bye Sally. Bye bye Grace. Bye bye Goodson. Yeah, now we could push the button and say leave. <laughs>